Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate the opportunity to provide an update on what's been going on in the conservation authority world as it relates to the, uh, the level one or class one electrofishing. Um, I, I'm not going to spend too much time on my presentation. I'm hoping to have a relatively long discussion uh, at the end of my talk. So I, I do have a few slides, but it's, it's not going to be too many. Um, so hopefully, hopefully this changes. Let's see. Hopefully that's the second slide now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just a little bit of background for those that uh, that, that don't know or are, are new to the game. Uh, the province that developed equipment and operating guidelines and procedures in 1986, and those were updated in 2008, but still remained as draft. So there's never been an officially approved electrofishing guideline procedure document uh, in the province. Um, MNRF staff were uh, the only ones that were required to follow. Uh, but there was no provincial requirement for others to be certified. So uh, us in the CA world, consultants, NGOs, academia, they adopted the guidelines and followed the guidelines, but there was no requirement for them to do that or follow them. Uh, and, and that'll be uh, important uh, as you'll see in the next couple of slides. Uh, there is uh, two types of electrofishing certification in the province, uh, class one and class two. Class one is the uh, quote unquote higher level where you can operate boat, punt, shore units and backpack units. You're also certified and able to teach the class two of the backpack electrofishing and that certification is valid for five years. The class two training uh, allows you to lead backpack electrofishing crews and is valid for three years. <clears throat> the class one training was a bit of a different beast than the class two. Uh, it was led by the uh, MNRF and the Institute for Watershed Science at Trent University. And it was, a, it was a bit different in that it was a single annual expensive uh, three-day course uh, that required people to stay over, um, and it was limited enrollment every year. As a result, there was probably somewhere around 30 people or so that, that could take that course uh, annually. Uh, it had in-class and field evaluation components. So a uh, better part of an afternoon was spent in class. And then uh, there was time spent uh, netting on a boat, uh, running a punt or a shore unit, and then uh, a, a big backpack focus as well. It was last held in 2018 and MNRF essentially just abandoned it. There wasn't really much communication or any communication and people were left to figure out what to do. And again, there's no provincial requirement as far as I understand it, uh, other than for MNRF staff. I've never been asked to show my electrofishing certification whenever I've applied for a scientific collectors permit. Uh, so it'd be a nice thing to have in my desk drawer or on my wall, but uh, uh, it, it's never, I've never had to show it to, to anybody. And that's my understanding the same with, with others. So it, it really meant when MNR got out that, that it was kind of a, um, you know, there's no rules really around what people needed to do or not do. Uh, so for us at CVC, and I think for a lot of the other CAs, it was really, we were looking for some training to satisfy our health and safety and due diligence liability concerns. We wanted to demonstrate should something go wrong that we had sufficient training and appropriate training uh, to allow us to operate the gear uh, correctly. And, uh, and so we, we got together 12 CAs uh, from across the province. Uh, we worked to develop a replacement class one course. Uh, in talking to MNRF, we couldn't call it class one, so we called it level one. And it's essentially really just the MNRF course with a CA stamp on the front. Um, there is some updating on it in terms of the uh, reference to MNRF policies and guidelines and safe working procedures or standard operating procedures. 
but it, it's really the same the same course. It was a good course. The information was solid. Uh, so we didn't really feel there was a need to, to change it. Uh, so we haven't changed things like the certification period, uh, the PPE, uh, first aid requirements, et cetera. One thing we have changed, and there were some complaints and comments about it in the iterations of the MNRF class one course, was the field component um, for people say operating a boat uh, really the training all it did was allow you to you got trained to net fish you didn't really operate the boat um, so this was an opportunity to sort of change that up and uh, we've decided that the field component occur will occur at the attendees place of employment or if that's not possible then perhaps in neighboring ca um and we also had covid uh show up as well so we've we've kind of had to change things a little bit to work in a covid world um so last year we did a uh, a virtual in class training uh course for ca staff it was an afternoon uh and there was no cost to it a lot of the cost i guess in the past was um accommodations for people to stay over and staff time to you know for, for three days uh so given that this was just an afternoon it was it was pretty simple to go with a, a free course we had 29 attendees from 15 cas across the province uh, and over time you know we've, we've certainly had some discussions around training non-ca staff but but there are questions around insurance and liability, what would happen if something went wrong, who would be liable. Um, so more recently, uh, the, the direction I've got from sort of our overseeing body, Conservation Ontario, is our current insurance does not allow us to provide training to people not employed by a CA. Uh, as I understand it, this also affects backpack training, so class two. Um, that said, we're hoping to sort of understand what that means and what changes would be necessary that might allow us to provide that sort of training. Um, what are the insurance costs to that? Uh, how might we cover those cost implications if, if there are substantial cost implications? Uh, and what might be the timeline to get those changes done? Uh, some of the other questions that uh, that we've kind of been wrestling with, and uh, in, in some recent conversations with MNRF and uh, and DFO, I don't know if Robin Gasparti is on on the call now, um, but she's got some thoughts too. And it, it it actually sounds like independently, MNRF, uh, DFO, and and us in the CA world have kind of arrived. That's sort of a similar place, uh, and, and some of these questions I think we're we're are similar to all organizations. Um, for us in the CA world, we've had some discussions around would future courses be virtual or in person. There are some obvious advantages to being virtual: no travel time, no accommodation time. Um, so the cost drops significantly, which was a, a real issue in the past. Um, but being in person is a lot nicer. The, the conversations that you can have when you're face to face, I think, are a lot better than than when you're online. Uh, so we'll we'll you know, we'll see where that goes. Uh, I meant free or paid. Obviously, free is a much more preferred option, I'm sure. But if there's say significant staff time involved in organizing a course, then you know then there might be a cost uh, recovery needs. Um, might it be a single training course where it's similar to what was done in the past or could there be multiple training opportunities maybe there's a, a training course in, in southwest ontario and central ontario and eastern ontario or maybe it's, if it's all virtual um it would be just something that you could view online on your own time and then you'd schedule the field component uh, uh separately there's also been a suggestion that perhaps MNRF would still be interested in, in approving trainers, course materials, 
uh, and then signing course completion letters. So uh, I haven't had that discussion with MNRF, but you know maybe CAs or some other body would be the sort of the implementation wing, and MNRF would be the overseer still. Um, in the past, there's been no uh, real criteria for who's a certified instructor. Um, under the, the current uh, guidelines, once you get your three days or 12 hours, and technically you can go and train people. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't think that's quite enough experience, but uh, so, so maybe there's some, some need to have some additional wording around what a good instructor or what an instructor would require to teach the course. Uh, we've chatted about maybe having uh, regular instructors meetings, so perhaps representatives from CAs, DFO, MNRF, um, academia, private sector could meet annually to go over the course and make sure that we're all teaching to the same standard. One of my concerns is that over time, if we have all a bunch of different bodies teaching a course, that that some of the training that uh, the standards that we learned in a, in the single course might change somewhat. So some of the things that that aren't required, for example, outside of the province um, in the U.S., I don't you know there's people that, that don't wear gloves when they're electrofishing, or they're they're only wrist length gloves, or in places there's nets on anodes, and as as people's memory of of the training in Ontario perhaps changes or new people come in from outside the province. Um, I, I could see maybe some differences in in the, the techniques or the uh, PPE. So maybe uh, say a regular meeting to ensure we're all singing from the same songbook might be uh, worthwhile. Uh, and one thing I've started to think about more recently is do we really need class one and class two? If Electrical theory is the same, what, you know, whether you're using a boat or a backpack. Um, and, and if you're learning at your place of employment rather than at the course, um, you would get trained and certified on the equipment at your, at your workplace. Uh, so, so do we really need class one and class two? Obviously class two training still exists in Ontario. There's still organizations teaching that. Uh, Ontario Streams, Charter Limited Canada, Fleming College, and maybe a couple others. Uh, and then is, is there perhaps a role for the chapter uh, in teaching the course um, or being involved in administrating the course or who, who knows? Um, so I, I think that's my last slide here. And I open it up to questions, comments, thoughts. I haven't been looking at the chat, so I, I don't know uh, if for somebody if Craig or Sarah has been following it. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been following it. We could we could let Anne loose if she wants to uh, to speak. Oh, yeah. She has she has some good points. Anne, do you want to? Is, is she is Anne ranting or <laughs> no? It's just uh... I I can. I can promote Anne here. And if anyone else who is involved with this certification or has anything to say about this, you know, we can promote you so that you can discuss because it might be easier than typing away. So just raise your hand and I'll I'll give you that. I just bumped I Anne up and I think Anne, you're I think you're unmuted now. Yeah, I'm I think I'm unmuted now. Thank yep. you okay. very much for that power. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, yeah, a lot I'm of here. questions. You know, the one about uh, uh, MTO chimed in and Sean Stewart chimed in about um, uh, liability and just having training, even though it's not a required prerequisite per se. Um, I've, I just wanted to throw some fuel on the fire about the net on the anode thing because <laughs> I've done it and I, I'm good with it because you don't keep the power on. You know, and there's less chance of burning the fish. You don't have to hold them. You don't chase them. They're stunned long enough for you to come off that dead person switch and uh, and grab them. Not as many fish get by you. So anyhow, I thought that would be a kind of thing that a cook lab master student might want to take on. 
that's all. I'll start knitting now, and then I won't have so much to say. If the <laughs> your, your thoughts are always welcome, Anne. Okay. <laughs> My yarn muzzle. Like the the, the MTO consideration is something I'm not familiar with, and, and Allison mentioned it to me this afternoon, and it, and I was reminded of it. Uh, you know, uh, I guess as part of MTO projects for consultants that bid on MTO projects, MTO requires them to demonstrate. Uh, certification with electrofishing, and uh, I guess it's my, that's been a problem. Not surprisingly, since mm -hmm. since there's no certification being offered uh, for boat or, or the plant in the last few yes, years. Yes, and those might run out. And I also like your um, uh, comment on uniformity and that people, different people, can be diff teaching different things. And you might get that telephone game where stuff gets really watered down as you pass it uh you know several um tiers of training might happen and the person at the at the receiving end doesn't get all the original material so i thought that was a good idea to you know it'd have to be something ad hoc but you know to get people from the different sectors to all talk about how they're keeping their people safe um the one thing I've always found crazy about is electro fishing is that you know i had to qualify in ontario then i went out to bc and that, that didn't worked there and then I recertified twice in BC and then it came back from Ontario and I had to recertify like you know electricity Edison straightened it out right like I don't know why we need two provinces to okay us for electro fishing it should be right. well, could be well, a national certainly, standard that's certainly one of my concerns and in, in the past when you you know when you looked at a resume and you saw somebody had Ontario class one electro fishing or class two for that matter you knew what you were getting right so yeah so, so now future, you don't know and and in the future my concern is that you don't necessarily know what you're getting so so somebody you know they put on the resume i've i've taken the mnrf class one course assumingly that's going to be you know not that different but you never know so so as a ca do i need to retrain that person to you show might. them the way i want them to electrofish to ensure yes. that they're doing what i think is safe um because because they they might have been told you can wear a little length gloves or you don't need gloves or you can put a net on an anode or whatever it might be that, that differs from the training that i'm familiar with um so so my concern is that that we're going to be in a world where where you you know you you work for mnrf one summer and you get their training you go to dfo you get their training you come to a ca you get their training Mm -hmm. And then you go to a consultant and you get their training. And that seems really crazy to me. <laughs> but the training will be simpler, I think, right? You'll you'll take you spend an afternoon in a in a classroom or something, and then you'll do a field component, but it, it's still extra class time or training time that maybe you don't need to do. So so I think the consistency piece to me is a is a real issue that we need to kind of figure out. Yep. Oh, and you should have uh, the colleges at that, the colleges who teach electrofishing in that room with the, um, like Fleming, uh, in that room with all the uh, uh, the gurus of uh, the backpack. Yep. With the MNR process no longer in existence, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, class one individuals could go on and train for class two. Is that correct? You could have a class one uh, certified person train someone to be a class two backpacker. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and and it's it's just a little confusing now if that process is antiquated. You does, know, these, does that process even exist anymore? That's the there's question. No, there's no class one course, right? So exactly. So yeah. that that's that's sort of what I meant by there's no rules in my mind. You I can am. you can you can write your own rules in terms of how you want to handle that that training um i mean i actively know cons other outfits that have former class oneers that are still doing class two training and printing out their own certificate and you know on if, if your workplace is is comfortable with with you as a class one person and you know say your say your class one expires is five is hit, hit that five-year window yeah your class one expires you don't and, and you've been electrofishing regularly over that five-year period you don't suddenly forget it as soon as your certification <laughs> expires, right? Yeah. So, so what makes you less competent in that six year than you were the previous year? Yeah. 
nothing, nothing really. So, and it, so you, if you're, if your employers, the way I see it, if your employer is comfortable with you continuing to electrofish, you know, maybe you need to do sort of an internal recertification or demonstration that what you're doing is, is appropriate. But mm -hmm. there's, it, it, it comes down now to, in my mind, to, to each individual employer and a standard that they want, that they're willing to accept to, for their staff to demonstrate um, you know, the ability to, to electrofish properly. Yeah. Um, so, so that part of, you know, part of what, do we need class two? Like what's, what's the point of class two? If you, if, if you go and demonstrate that, that you can, you have enough skill and you can go and teach the backpack to somebody, but what's, what's the point of a class two certification? I see some comments in the in the chat about maybe nobody wanting to take on this potential liability insurance concern. I know just we've informally discussed it as the uh, AFS Ontario chapter. And yeah, it just kind of all comes back to, well, we heard this group isn't really interested necessarily because of the liability. And then we say, well, you know, why the hell would we be interested <laughs> for the same sure. issue, right? Sure. Like, I think the, from what I understand, and I, I might be getting it a little bit wrong, the province doesn't really have insurance, but they're the province, so they're covered. Like, it, <laughs> right. it, it, it's a bit of a different world. But then um, for, for everybody else, it, you know, they need, they need an insurance policy that speaks to training people on how to electrofish. And, and I don't know what the cost of that is, what, what, the, what the insurance guys think that that you know, might, might be in terms of premiums or, or whatever, um, or whether they would even think, you know, whether they even want to take it on. I, I, have, I have no idea. So that's what I'm, I'm hoping to have those discussions to kind of figure that out. Um, but you know, I, I understand that not everybody's going to want to take on that liability. And, and you know, that could be the, certainly the case for the chapter. Um, as well, I know it's, uh, and, and then you know we, we might end up again in a world where everybody's doing their own thing, which I don't think is great. But but nobody's in charge, <laughs> right? There's... You let the fish out. Yeah. <laughs> um... um, sorry, I know there's another question. I just wanted to touch on um, what John said about you know do we do all virtual, all in person? And I, I mentioned that the field component should be in person, person, and that's not just to get the safety of electrofishing down, but um, there's so much more you can benefit from from being in the field with a bunch of people with experience. Uh, I recertified with um, uh, Fleming College uh, last uh, last year, 2020, I think, 21, and um, you know that you're doing fish identification with the students. You're, uh, you know, talking about field field stuff and just all all good. Um, it's just a different vibe, you know, than sitting on a computer. You, you don't send somebody with, to learn how to do a chainsaw by video. So I think we should keep doing um, electric fishing practical in person. I, and, I to totally agree. I, yeah, I don't. Uh, um, and, and to a certain extent, I, I'd like to see the in-class part face to face too. But that's you know that's got some pros and cons. The, the practical absolutely should be in person. I don't I don't see that you, that you can do that virtually. Last year at our when we did our training course last year, um, most of the people there had had class one or or minimum class two. We didn't have a single question in the four hour course. I, I attribute a lot of that just to being virtual. Um, it, it was not a, it's not a great environment to, to learn in. I think we, you know, there's, there's advantages around people don't, not having to travel and, and whatnot, not having to worry about booking, uh, you know, meeting rooms and all that sort of thing. So there are advantages, but there's our, you know, there are drawbacks to the virtual thing too. 
Um, Andre, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, I was just going to bring up, and I know this has come up in other conversations, uh, like private sector companies like NRTG based out in BC, they do training and they do training in Ontario and they certify people in Ontario to do e-fishing in Ontario. Um, what's different is they have really clear written sort of they're certified by WorkSafe BC out West, whereas in Ontario, they're just kind of say they're certified by various provincial and national WorkSafe agencies. So like you said, John, there's no single umbrella thing basically giving them an accreditation but like does it really matter who does the class if that single kind of person to give an accreditation doesn't exist and for me it makes the most sense for it to be ministry of labor or something like that yeah I, i'm not sure andre who might do that ultimately um i didn't realize that um uh, but that company in bc is actually coming to ontario um I, I chatted with one of their their staff in 2020 or 2021 um i know I, I don't have a you know if they I, I could be wrong i didn't think they were in ontario i thought if you had to if you were getting training from them you had to go to bc um but i say I, I could be wrong but i don't know what level you know what sort of standards they're using you know whether the trainings here or in in bc um yeah i, I don't you know gloves if they were i think all their photos look like they're wearing wrist length gloves not elbow length gloves um angela and allison have some questions about that what do other provinces do i don't know if it's about insurance or if it's about the actual certification I, i'm not sure what what else going on elsewhere it's a good question um, it's probably worthwhile to look into it yeah they definitely do do, do classes in, in ontario um and they require elbow length gloves yeah. okay well. yeah i think the what's different is out west you don't you also don't have to wear rubber waders you can wear breathable waders um whereas in ontario you can't which is a whole other annoying conversation that we can go down into as well <laughs> 